Yeah. Okay. Good. <laughs> Levels are looking good. What are you doing in Colombo? You were just uh, sky racing of some type? Paraglider racing. Yeah. I'm actually in Brazil. Ah. I was in Colombia and now I just had to flew a big competition in Brazil. So I fly back to the States in a couple of days. And how did you place in the competition? Did you win? Uh, I did very poorly. Okay. Um, unfortunately, I got a brand new racing glider that turned out to have some issues. Oh. So I spent most of, I spent most of the week trying to trim it. Um, we got a bunch of rain. A competitor died. It was a pretty rough week. Whoa. Yeah. Yeah, it was the Pan American Championship, so it was teams from every country in North and South America, and I snuck in to represent New Zealand. Did um, where was the the competitor who died? Where was he from? Or he or she? I don't, I, I don't know. Brazil, actually, it was one of the locals. Oh, which was even made it made it even heavier, you know. Yeah, yeah. When your home team been, suffers a loss like that, I haven't been in a comp where somebody's died in quite a while. Hmm. So, puts everything in perspective. Yeah. Hello everyone, welcome to Adventures to the Mind. I am your host as always, James W. Gesso. This podcast is not intended to endorse or support the use of psychedelic drugs, but god damn, I'll tell you what, it is intended to endorse and encourage open, intelligent dialogue on taboo subjects. Psychedelics, truly their greatest harm, emerges from ignorance and we cannot clear out ignorance if we don't talk openly. So this is why this podcast exist to increase what Paul Austin from the third wave calls psychedelic literacy as well as to generally provide awesome inspiring content for you the listener. Speaking of inspiring awesome content on today's show we have James Orock, the author of this book The New Psychedelic Revolution The Genesis of the Visionary Age. Let me just read off the back of the book. James Orock is the author of Tryptamine Palace, is an accomplished extreme sports journalist, photographer, and contributor to the Maps Journal and Reality Sandwich. He travels the world speaking at entheogenic conferences and transformational festivals. When not traveling, he lives in both the Dominican Republic and New Orleans, and his book is actually excellent. I very much enjoyed it. In particular, I really enjoyed the sense of real longevity and richness at the foundation of what we consider now to be psychedelic culture. I even for myself, I I present as though I am very confident in my yeah, I'm a psychedelic person, but it's amazing how much old patterns of shame and guilt emerge, old stigma emerges when people ask me what I do and sometimes I try to find different ways to dance around the fact that I do psychedelic stuff because I fear that people are not going to properly respect the integrity of what I do simply by nature of their pre-established assumptions as to what psychedelics are and what psychedelic culture represents and a very long time ago I you know I learned and still really fully believe that we should not cast our pearls onto swine. Now, not to say that people who are living in stigma are swine, but it's a general premise to say that it's like, don't take really beautiful things and pass them on to people who will not be able to understand them. And as a consequence of a lack of understanding, ultimately tarnish something that's very precious. And my relationship to psychedelic culture is very precious. Anyways, what James Orock did when I, or for me when I read this book is give me a sense of how rich and complex and beautiful the culture that we now call the visionary or psychedelic culture, where it comes from and, and the depth of commitment that people have put in to allowing it to be such a vibrant thing that exists now across, you know, various places in the world, but we could say epitomized in art and music culture and festivals like Boom, 
Burning Man, Shambhala, Ozora, etc. Anyway, something else that's really interesting about James Orock is his ideas around 5-MeO-DMT. He's also the author of this sort of infamous uh, tryptamine palace where he talks about his work with 5-MeO-DMT and applies a, a the physics of quantum mechanics onto his theories around what is happening with the brain and with the brain and the self's interpretation or experience of reality when the very sense of subject and object dissolves away and the only thing that exists is a singular subjectivity of all time and space existent as a, again, singular subjectivity that just happens to be I. Anyways, maybe I didn't do a great job of explaining it, but James does in this interview. So really appreciated this conversation with James, and I do think that you will appreciate it as well. Before we get into it, I want to thank my patrons on Patreon, in particular the people whose names are listed in the upper corner of this video on YouTube and listed in the description to this episode. Without my patrons, I would not be able to do this. So thank you very, very much. I also am funded by one-time donations on PayPal and through cryptocurrency, and I also couldn't do it without you contributors as well. So thank you for those one-time donations coming in too. If you, the listener, are enjoying the show and enjoying this content and would like to support the development and sustainability of it, you can do so by becoming my patron on Patreon by heading to patreon.com forward slash James W. Gesso or by doing a one-time PayPal or crypto donation. Links to all of that are contained in the description to this episode, whether it be on YouTube, whatever podcatcher you listen to it on, and at jameswgesso.com. Okay, here is my interview with James Orock on Adventures Through the Mind. Enjoy. Interesting, yeah. Um, it's funny because it's like, uh, for something like 5-MeO-DMT, which you, you know, say is like, which I'll ask you about later, like the apex entheogen ego dissolution uh, it seems to there seems to be a lot of really big egos in the in the five world <laughs> yeah oh shit i've been thinking about that a lot myself yeah um yeah uh, so, well, my theory on the my theory on the ego is well known and it's not even my own but it's like the ego is like a muscle and psychedelics tear it down but like muscle it'll build back up stronger if it's not dealt with and recognized, you know, kind of mental stretching, I guess. Yeah. So especially what I see with these guys that like to do all this tail ending, you know, taking the hit mm. after each, each client, whatever you want to call them. And then they feel like they're in the experience with you and all this to me, total bullshit. That's to me, just, you just watch their egos getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and, Suddenly, they're more important than the five meo. I just think it's funny. Hmm. Hmm. You know? Yeah. There's definitely. I, I just had um, Raphael. Oh, how do you say his last name? Lancelotto on, and uh, you know, at, w we can include this bit if you're okay with it. Um, and he, you know, wouldn't want to talk about anyone in particular, uh, which is understandable. But he did talk about like the problems around the traveling weekend. Uh, five shaman and the you know like this bolstering bigger and bigger into this sense of um, self-righteousness in being the one with the medicine and like the structure around it so it's an interesting it's an interesting thing to consider you know in one of timothy leary's autobiographies i forget which one one of the earlier ones he talks about the first time they took psilocybin outside of a, a, a clinical setting and how they, they basically steal the pills and take them back to his house and how him and like two or three other guys do it. And then there's this whole trip about, I have the power. I, you know, like he goes through the whole trip in his head the very first time. And it's totally like, it's, uh, you know, the, some of Timothy Leary's writings I really like when he's actually being really just straight out honest about what was going on. And it's very, it's very like you can just see the parallels now. It's quite funny. Hmm. Interesting. So let's 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 instead of uh, deconstructing other people's yeah, ideas, start, start where you want to start. <laughs> uh, all right. So welcome, James Orock. Welcome to Adventures of the Mind. My pleasure. Nice to be here. 
So your new book, um, The New Psychedelic Revolution, um, I think I, oh shit, I have it. I had it with me, but I left it in the kitchen now. Um, it's quite good. I really enjoyed it. I just like dove right in. There was something really nourishing uh, in it uh, that just like, I just gobbled it up. So I want to thank you first and foremost for this excellent book. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, I've been very uh, gratified by the by the response and reviews I've been getting from people. Um, it's a very different book to my first book, Tryptamine Palace. And in some ways, I think I wrote it deliberately to be a bit more um, broader and more digestible to more people. Um, and it, yeah, it seems like people are uh, responding to it. Yeah, well, I, in all honesty, I haven't read Tryptamine Palace. Um, although I was first, I first encountered it when I was in like the absolute depth of my most reckless drug use, and I was in a crew of people who, in Melbourne, who just loved to get high all the time, but also were extremely intelligent. And so I stumbled like into all sorts of interesting conversations, and I remember very specifically um, tripping out and sitting with someone, and them pulling up the trip to mean palace, you know, with the, with the toad on the front of it. And it was like, Oh, this book is fucking crazy. And they were like going off about it. I'm like, wow, that's really intense. But it always kind of intimidated me because it was such a huge book. But having read, um, your new book, you sort of unpack some of the ideas that are in the trip to mean palace, sort of laying a foundation. Um, maybe we could start there for people. And then I want to get into discussions about visionary culture and its origins and, and, and it's, it's, what it might reflect now as a sort of subculture within the larger dominant globalized capitalistic culture. Um, so why don't you give us a rundown, a, a synopsis of the, the tryptamine palace and the role five MEO DMT has played in the um, development of your thesis around the nature of consciousness. Yeah. Well, I wouldn't be, we wouldn't be at this podcast. if It wasn't five methoxy DMT. Um, when I discovered that in my mid thirties, quite legally by the internet and via on a very small window of opportunity, um, I think I considered myself a pretty seasoned psychonaut who, had, you know, maybe put his wild years behind him. I did had some, you know, did a lot of uh, exploration in my twenties, and then as I got more into my thirties, I got more into yoga and climbing and outdoor stuff, and you know. I still had a psychedelic component to my life, but I don't think I thought it was uh, as important as it was at one point. Uh, and then 5-MeO-DMT turned everything upside down because mm. it basically the story of Tryptamine Palace is how I was a hardened, scientific, rationalist atheist, and I smoked 5-MeO-DMT at kind of a low point in my, in my even belief in psychedelic culture. As I say in the, the book, I, I really expected to be a cross between a bong hit and a hit of acid. Mm. And uh, I came out of the other side of the experience, you know, like a newborn. Um, I believed I'd had a mystical encounter with a supreme consciousness. And being an atheist 40 minutes earlier, that caught me by surprise. Um, and then, you know, I'm not, the, I'm not the kind of person that can just go through an experience like that and take it for granted. Mm -hmm. So I ended up spending the majority of the next five years researching everything I could about tryptamines and spirituality and consciousness and led me into all kinds of uh, far, far edges of quantum physics. And I actually have come up in Tryptamine Palace, I actually present a working model of how I think the transpersonal experience happens as a as a function of quantum consciousness. Um, so I think one of the pe reasons people really like tryptamine palace is it actually has substance and it has some developed ideas in it of you know rather than just in ca uh, recounting my own experiences. Though there's a fair amount of that in there as well. Mm. Um, um, and I, you know, that set me on this path. I mean, I spent five years thinking about that, working on that, and then I actually gave the book away at Burning Man for two years because I thought it was unpublishable. And then I was convinced to get it ready for self-publishing. And then I sent two copies into two publishers to get used to getting rejected. Yep. And my favorite publisher in the traditions accepted it and set me on this now almost ten-year 
journey of being a recognized psychedelic author who gets invited to conferences and festivals and I've got to meet a lot of my heroes and it's been an amazing journey. So five of me, I certainly turned my world upside down. Hmm. Yeah, that's gorgeous. I, I definitely, uh, while reading your book, I, I had this moment of, uh, well, how, how could I describe it? Feeling like, um, feeling like a celebration in, in what you writing that book accomplished for you in your life and for like the larger psychedelic community and feeling really uh, sort of like nourished in my own direction in my own path looking and being like yeah see like it is possible like rock did it you know like i can do it too so that was like because i i guess i looked yep. up to you as i was reading this book as well because i really appreciated that you seem to have successfully embodied the i mean we could unpack these terms but i'll just say it loosely like sort of the archetypal path of the psychedelic successful psychedelic author yeah, I mean, I feel very blessed to have been published in this day and age. And, I, you know, I realized along the way that I was just the right guy with the right set of tools for, for a, new, a new compound, the same way Huxley was for mescaline and Terence was for mushrooms and DMT. You know, I was lucky enough to be at the right place at the right time. Um, and I do think, you know, I have a long history of um, extreme sports journalism, and I think that that actually helped me to be able to write about something as as um, personal as 5-MeO DMT without it coming across too preachy, maybe. Mm. Well, I, I I haven't uh, I have not experienced 5-MeO DMT not directly and in its pure form, but I in writing about psychedelics, I could definitely see how um, narrativizing extreme sports experiences uh, would. Um, would translate really well into narrativizing psychedelic experiences, which is sort of like extreme consciousness sports or something. Yeah, they're all journeys. Mm -hmm. on one type, uh, you know. So um, there's you gotta, this. You got to be able to laugh at yourself. Yeah. Uh, so you're the right man for the job, and you represented a, a particular sort of vantage point on experiencing this molecule, and one that I really appreciated, which is that you, you. Consider yourself to be a mystic. In our current cultural climate, in you know what um, some people call the third wave of psychedelics, there's this very strong push towards medicalization, which is an important push because it's going to be the sort of the train of legitimization that can bring psychedelics back into the modern world and give them a place of really powerful functional use for people who are suffering from otherwise you know, untreatable, you know, mental conditions. But that can very quickly become a very hard-lined approach. And I think it's just one particular way of looking at the potentials of psychedelics. And you unpack another way, which um, I find to be really nourishing and very important, which is this idea of psychedelics as truly as entheogens. And you you approach it from a place of being, you know, a self-proclaimed mystic, which in reading your work, it, it appears as far as I could tell that that is what you are, at least how you're living. Can you maybe unpack that a little bit more for us about what do you mean by, say, what, what is an entheogen? What is a mystical approach to psychedelics? And where does 5-MeO-DMT fall into that sort of larger paradigm? Well, you know, the term entheogen came about kind of as a code word, for psychedelics in some ways, in the same way that visionary art has now replaced the term psychedelic art. But there was also an intent to express a deeper uh, level to certain psychedelics and their ability to actually invoke a true mystical experience. Um, when I had my 5-MeO DMT experience, my plus four, as Sasha Shulman would say, um, at the height of it, you know, you become consciousness without identity so you really experience what they what some people call god consciousness or cosmic consciousness with no sense of identity or ego at all and what this is what stan groff you know uh, renamed the transpersonal experience so one of the big recognitions for me when i actually had that experience was oh well this is actually just the classical mystical experience like this is an experience that human individuals have had throughout time over and over and over again from different 
different methodologies and often unintended. I don't. I really don't think you can you can chase a mystical experience. In some ways, they just they're a bit like lightning. They just happen, mm. you know. Um, but yeah, I think it's important if we can. And Roland Griffin is now starting, you know, in Harvard, I believe, and John Hopkins, they're now going to start doing trials with 5-methoxy-DMT mm. in the way they did the psilocybin trials, which is definitely a step in the right direction. And I think if we can legitimize the idea that psychedelics can induce a classical mystical experience, then that helps um, clear their way in the future for them becoming integrated into our society. Like, I really think... Uh, you know, the medicalization of psychedelics is, is a little bit of a band-aid for the bigger problem, which is we have a, we have a massively depressed society that's, that subconsciously recognizes our backs are up against the wall and that human beings might become extinct within the next 50 to 100 years, or at least there's a whole lot of hell coming. Mm. So I think this is just the, you know, the elephant in the room that nobody wants to speak about. Everybody tries to go to work and do their thing and You've got to be insane to be sane to function in this world. And they've got most people functioning just because they're overloaded trying to survive. Mm. But once you break free of that and you realize, you know, to be mystically inclined is also to be pretty open to what's going on in the world. And there's a lot of pain and suffering on our planet at the moment. And I think, you know, there's this this search for this cure that will, that will solve uh, societal depression, but there's a reason that depression is there to start with. Mm. But, you know, I don't think psychedelics are the answer for that. I think reshaping our society is the answer for that. But I do think that psychedelics can help provide a meaningful spiritual element to modern life. Mm. Yeah, I, I, I completely agree, agree with you. Um, can you unpack God and the relationship psychedelics play um, in the human experience of relating to or as God? Well, I hated the word God. Like, it just annoyed me. And then after I had my uh, first 5 you know, DMT experience, it was the only word that I really could use. And a, and a lot of my friends thought it was really funny. Like they were like, oh, I thought I was starting a cult, or I'd become a born again Christian. <laughs> right. Like, what, what's happened to Rock? You know, he's got off the deep end. But it was really the only word that I had to describe what I'd encountered. And I realised that's it might have been the first word. You know, the first time a monkey ate a bunch of mushrooms and came out the other side with a new way of linking symbols. You know, I honestly think that was the first word. And I think it's a word that every culture's had. There's a reason it exists. You know, we've gone down a narrow alleyway and we've tried to prove that we're smarter and bigger and better than God. But our biggest problem is we haven't updated the two. We're still running around. You know, our Western culture still clings to a 1,000, 1,500-year-old concept mm. that hasn't been updated because – mostly because the Christian church has refused to accept the fact that that the Bible's not dogma, but, but metaphor, as Joseph Campbell would say. It's interesting to see how open the new Pope is. Mm. This, I don't know if you've been reading about the conversation. He's been having a series of conversations with a 93-year-old atheist who runs a newspaper in Italy, and one of the conversations they had last weekend, God, uh, the Pope basically said that hell doesn't exist, but um, if you've had a bad life, your soul will just dissipate. So mm. it sounds like he believes in some form of reincarnation, mm. which, you know, when the Pope is the guy who's making sense, we know we're in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> so so where, where, does, where, where does this all fall into um, the potentials of psychedelics in building relationship to the, to the sense of um, God? And, and I guess when you said like the old model for God, you're talking about you know, the patriarchal man in the sky, guilt and shame, yeah. punishment, that guy. Um, well, so, the, the God that our sciences has proven is untenable. Right. You know? But, but you know, to me, the cutting edge of spirituality is physics and cosmology and the cutting edge of human thought where there are ideas that are just so mind-blowing, but there's this determination not to say that there's any rhyme or reason behind it, that it's all just this 
I mean, to me, it seems more and more obvious that the that the universe is intuitive. It has some form of consciousness that permeates all of it and allows it to evolve at the rate that it evolves. And there is there is direction and progression and and a reason to it, even though we don't know what it is. I don't think the the universe is too fine tuned for consciousness to exist, for consciousness not to play a a role. Um, so I think we're going through a whole era of, you know, maybe perhaps trying to infuse some spirituality back into science, and certainly trying some, you know, we need spirituality back in the human element because at the moment our lives are quite um, tragic without it. And just and just to be clear, when you're saying spirituality, you're talking about an active engagement, recognition, um, relationship to this higher structure of reason that's present in the universe, Re reason well, or intelligence or consciousness. Well, I mean, even when I say I was an atheist, I would say my first spiritual leanings were on magic mushrooms or LSD out of nature. Mm-hmm. You know, growing up in a Protestant country and getting dragged to church the odd Sunday and Easter, and none of it made any impression on me. But taking psychedelics and being in the mountains, that opened me up to the feeling that there was more connectivity and more going on. So maybe that was the start of my spiritual path. And I think millions and millions of young Westerners would say the same thing. Mm -hmm. I would. And then our, our, our whole interest in Eastern religion, Eastern philosophy, other philosophies, other schools of thought largely came out of the loosening up of consciousness from the psychedelic, first psychedelic wave of the 60s. Uh, the environmental movement came out of 30 million people dropping acid and hugging a tree. Right. You know, so psychedelics have already opened us up, but but they are very hard to direct. So you see us going in lots of different directions. Like at the moment, I am a bit dismayed by it seems like there's this fall, there's this constant fallback into cultism and these charismatic shamanic types with their followers and their believers. And it just goes on and on and on from, from Tim Leary to Charles Manson. And now we've got our own ones these days with these, you know, it's the, cult of the personality grows up around the psychedelics. I would, I would love to see psychedelics be treated more scientifically or at least more neutrally. Mm. But there's this constant tendency to fall back on ritual and old ways and things rather than pushing forward to a new model and a new vision, I feel, mm. a modern elusive. Mm. So, um, there was one piece there that was juicy, but I want to I want to specifically get I'm like really fishing for a specific set of data here, which is like so psychedelics can increase this sense of there being a spiritual capacity to being alive. So then, what are your thoughts on the ego, psychedelics, and relating to God? Um, well, that's, that's an interesting question. I, I would say psychedelics open you up to the spiritual by showing you the interconnectivity of things. If I was going to put it in a non-denominal way. And the further they open you up, the more you realize everything's connected to the point of the supreme realization where you realize everything is what, excuse me, everything is one it's a transpersonal experience. To achieve the transpersonal experience, your ego has to die. Now, this is a very old concept and one you can read about and read about and read about, but until you actually experience it, it's a, it's a philosophical construct versus an actual physical reality. Mm -hmm. So I would say my 5-MeO-DMT experiences very much taught me the ego exists and the ship runs without it when it's when it's sent off on its own um you know i've seen the ego trapped in people's bodies when their consciousness is left 
was some, when I used to hold circles, I had one friend sit bold upright, let's just call him Joe, and he's going, what's Joe done? Where's Joe gone? Oh no, what's Joe done? <laughs> but, you know, because that was all that was left, was the little clinging bit of Joe was still in his body, but really he was, the consciousness was gone. This was just sort of like an echo that we were hearing from the other side of the universe. It was really eye-opening. You know, I've never seen such a, an obvious example. Um, the most, you know, I, it's interesting that we're having this conversation. We're sitting here, I'm sitting here in Rio de Janeiro, which is where I happened to actually um, finish Tryptamine Palace. Oh, interesting. Which is, the hill, which is just up the hill from where I'm staying, a neighbourhood called Santa Teresa. <laughs> And I had carried Eckhart Tolle's book, A New Earth, around with me for probably a year at that point. It was a book I kept putting in to read and just not reading it, not reading it, not reading it. And um, I finished Trip to Moon Palace, final, done, 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 off to the publishers, no more can be done. And I picked up A New Earth. And A New Earth is a very interesting deconstruction of the ego, from looking at it from different um different angles, different religions, and it's sort of a non-denominational way. And Tola does a pretty good job of being non-denominational, I think. He throws enough Christian stuff in there to keep, to keep the, the Christians happy. But you can, he, has, he has an interesting way of, oh, I think, of sifting through the great knowledges. And I was really, really glad that I hadn't read the book while I was writing Tryptamine Palace because it probably would have taken me another five years to finish Tryptamine Palace as I tried to integrate the wave of thoughts that I had from reading that book. I would say reading that book was the second greatest spiritual epiphany after 5-methoxy-DMT. Mm. I actually wrote some, I wrote a couple of letters to members of my family about some things that never get addressed, and it really helped me to get to the core of a few issues. Um. And you know, basically in this book, that's Tyler's whole premise is that the ego has become so dominant, we don't recognize there's anything else. And I think that's very true at this time and place in history. And I think psychedelics are the most effective dissolvers of the ego that we have. People don't have the time to meditate and do the ancient techniques that they used to do. They're not, it's, you know, a couple of hours of meditation a week's not going to take away all the programming and and angst of modern life. Psychedelics can. Um, in the new book, The New Psychedelic Revolution, I explore that idea a bit more into a bit more depth. Um, and especially, uh, you know, I'm struck by the 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 um, synchronicities between the discovery of psychedelics and in the modern era and Nuclear energy. Mescaline was synthesized the same year that Rotkin discovered, um, no, sorry, mescaline was isolated the same year that yeah. Rotkin discovered radiation. It was then synthesized in 1918, right between the two great wars. LSD was rediscovered by Albert Hoffman 75 years next week. Um, within weeks of the completion of the Manhattan Project. Now, if you were to say to me, what's the most egotistical invention that man's ever made? It's nuclear weapons. Mm. The idea that one human being has the right to order the deaths of millions of others based on their view of right and wrong, mm. which is totally an ego construct. So the fact, and what's, been the, what's the greatest societal dissolver of ego that's ever been discovered? LSD. There's no other drug that you can produce that much of in that short of a time. It was the perfect drug for the era to actually send a wave through American society that gave you a different way of looking at the ego. Now, there's a lot of arguments about whether that was an accident or deliberate, whether the CIA released LSD at that point in the 60s to dissolve the student protests and the student movement, and I think there's a lot of truth to that. I think the CIA and the MK Ultra program were totally aware that of what would happen if they did dump a bunch of acid 
just like they were aware of what happened when they dumped a bunch of heroin or cocaine in the ghettos. Yep. Drugs are used as weapons, weaponized in the USA for sure. Mm -hmm. But, you know, psychedelics have this way of penetrating. Um, my book, Trip to Mean Palace, while I was the right guy for the job, it was determined to get right written. It was, it was like there was a force pushing me to write it. I was actually working on a novel at the time that I stopped working on. It seemed like a really bad idea to write a book that I didn't think could get published. And there were definitely times where I dragged my heels, but it was determined to get written. It was determined to get off away to a bigger audience than Burning Man. It was determined to get published. It was like it was on rails. And as a writer, I've had other projects. I've seen the way things work. They don't usually go the way that book went. Mm -hmm. And I think LSD, psychedelics, are a little bit the same way. Like LSD was going to get out to society one way or another. It sat on that shelf all the way through World War II. Then it sent the, the premonition or the dream to Albert. And then it landed in the right hands. And if the CIA happened to be the seed, the Johnny Apple seed, well, maybe that was just the way it was meant to be. Mm. You know, there's no doubt that society has been changed by psychedelics, and it's mm -hmm. been one of the most significant forces post World War Two. So now, you know, I, I make the argument in in the new book that we are now actually on the verge of being the fifth, sixth great psychedelic culture, and that our psychedelic revolution is actually a hundred years old now. And it started with the interest in peyote and the extraction and the synthesis. And the synthesis of psychedelics is really our contribution to the history of psychedelic culture. And now there's more people globally doing psychedelics than there ever has been in any other time in history. So we'll mm. see where it all goes. Well, speaking of where it all goes, one of the places that you suggest um, this sort of like mass um, – the, the work how should i say this like the 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 breaching apex of psychedelic use is an extension of this would you say the fifth the fifth or the sixth um big psychedelic uh culture um is into visionary arts and what could be called um transformational festivals or festivals that are focused on the principles of visionary art um, a vast part of your book really focuses on the history of visionary art and its sort of um, it's it's fruiting into these massive festivals like Burning Man and like Boom and other festivals like Shambhala here in Canada, Ozora, etc. Um, this is such a huge concept that it's, it's explored so fully in the book. I'm not sure wh how to point your consciousness specifically to different things but maybe you can just give us a idea of like what what is visionary culture well i never thought i'd write a book about psychedelics and then five meo dmt came along and i wrote trip to mean palace and then i never thought i'd write another book about psychedelics but 10 years of being pretty much in the heart of contemporary psychedelic culture, and especially my association with Alex and Alison Gray, and then the whole younger wave of visionary artists, uh, Carrie Thompson, Luke Brown, Android Jones, Amanda Sage, Michael Devine, and crew. Um, I mean, I've been, a, I've been in the middle of this revolution that's going on, or this evolution in, in culture, and I kept waiting and waiting and waiting for somebody to write something about it um, and nobody more qualified did so I decided I'd have a go um, you know basically the book is about contemporary psychedelic culture and it set, it strives to explain how a new psychedelic culture evolved in the late 90s that's quite different from the 60s psychedelic culture um, it's more integrated it's a little more mainstream it's more tech and there's new drugs, there's new compounds, there's new heroes, there's new villains. Um, and we're very much, you know, it's interesting how you talk to kids at these festivals today and they've never heard of the acid tests or Ken Kesey or it's interesting, you know, 
how uneducated a lot of kids really are about where it's all come from. Mm -hmm. So the book was also, uh, you know, a bit of an attempt to show people that nothing happens overnight and that what's going on at the moment has been from the hard work of a lot of people over the last, you know, 30 years almost now. Um, so that was a, you know, I hope I was trying to give people the idea that, that there is, uh, there is a culture and its roots are deep. Um, and that, yeah, I've been, it's been a privilege to be a part of it and watching it evolve as it has. And now what it means, I don't really know. Is it, an, is it just a youth culture? Is it a social culture? Um, is it a networking culture? Uh, all that remains to me to be seen. I have noticed the festivals have gotten a lot younger and the principles that that started the festivals are increasingly being abandoned. Um, there was 4,000 bicycles left at Burning Man last year. <laughs> I mean, to a long-time burner, that number's just staggering. And everybody's trying to justify it by saying, oh, yeah, well, it ended up, they ended up, you know, going to the right people, rah, rah. but I mean, 4,000 people just left their bikes sitting on the plier and drove off, which shows you they didn't really get it. And, and that's unfortunately one of the things that happens when you make something like Burning Man a once-in-a-lifetime bucket list event rather than nourishing the community that actually created Burning Man. Mm -hmm. I think in very many ways the Burning Man org has turned its back on the community that actually created what they now market. And there's pockets still left out there. But it has evolved into the definitely the biggest um, show place for visionary art. It's the most unique art museum in the world for that week. And it's still the place where you'll meet the highest con density and concentration of the most interesting people you'll ever meet. So, so Burning Man is evolve, evolving into something different. Everything keeps evolving. Uh, transformational festivals have definitely become a fashion um, and and I see different uh, organizers all over the world using that meme or that model to varying degrees of success I, I would like to think the ones that are more um, pure in their purpose will have the more have the greatest success but it's interesting because it's definitely uh, bleeding back into mainstream culture and affecting mainstream culture, I believe now. So at least it's at least it, it's coming from a positive place. Hmm. So what are some of the qualities that you would attribute? Um, like what what are some of the qualities present in the cultural general cultural atmosphere of these of of a good visionary festival? Um, that is so nourishing to people. What, what are the what are the positive qualities that people seem to discover there that um, leads them to being so interested in it? I mean, I honestly think the core principles go all the way back to the diggers in San Francisco in the '60s, and you know, I think a lot of the no, leave no trace ethic and the, the the being open and being loving and you know side of it are old ideas and just keep getting reinvented. Um, I think having experienced transformational festivals all over the world, there's a definite sense of community that attracts people from the outside who don't have community. And they realize the more of these festivals you go to, the more that sense of community increases. Mm -hmm. So in many ways, for many of us, our traveling festival community is more real than the solid communities we live in in those spaces in between. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that is huge and it's really attracting a lot of kids these days because they just don't have community. I mean, it's interesting, like, going back to my home land of New Zealand and when I grew up, clubs were very strong. We had a big sailing club, you know, there was a climbing club, there was rugby clubs, like everybody was in clubs and we all did sport and that was how you grew up and you had this community of the club 
all your other kids at the club and their parents and you know that was we all had these different mechanisms in place healthy mechanisms that built up community mm -hmm. and I, I was quite disturbed when I got home to find out that most of these clubs have now collapsed or barely survive or have very poor attendances and when I tried to find out why nobody could really tell me other than that people work more and don't have as much spare time and you know, so the mechanism of actually creating community is increasingly eroding away in modern society. And that was just a really obvious example to me because I grew up running around the yacht club and the motorcycle club. And that was where I, you know, if you took that away from me, I don't know what, if you just, you're just running around at home then. So I, don't, I think festivals are, you know, transformational festivals in this era are providing that function. And that was the same thing that really was the attraction of the Woodstock 60s revolution was, you know, kids were living in squats, and but there was this amazing sense of community. And that's why I live in New Orleans, because we have one of the last great bohemian communities in America where people don't watch TV and they go out to, and support each other at all the things they do. And there's a lively, active sense that you're part of something rather than just doing going it by yourself so i think that's one huge attraction of transformational festivals and i would say their function if they work with the music and the art and the the, the, the community and the sense of trust and the, the set and setting is you can actually have really powerful transcendental transpersonal experiences there where you feel that you're, you know, you, you feel that sense of connectedness and you feel that greater sense of there is something greater. Um, Joseph Campbell always said that music and dance are the oldest known tools of transcendence. Um, so I think we put all those tools very effectively into play and a really great transformational festival like the symbiosis or you know, Azora in Hungary or Boom or Burning Man or LAB in different spots um, and the much smaller ones that I'm just, sorry, I'm uh, skipping my mind right now. But these days, the smaller ones are probably the way to go. Mm -hmm. uh, I could list a couple I, like Cosmos in Finland or Inshallah in Alberta, Canada or Astral Harvest yeah. also in Alberta, Canada. Well, that's it. These are organisms that are constantly springing up. So if you find, your, you know, you're in the right the right place and time you can really have some amazing experiences at these events mm -hmm. yeah with with or without the psychedelics but then in so <clears throat> without, excuse me. Yeah. right and, and with the psychedelics there's this um and, and i think you talk about it in in your book it's been probably like four weeks now since i read it so i might be uh conflating other things but that there's is there's strong and important emergence in these cultures to build structures of harm reduction and safety so that people can feel free to while also being fully and properly educated to dose psychedelics and not fall through the cracks in the system or like the the system of safety within the festival so um i you have the map zendo project and then in uh in in canada here the term used to reflect the you know the equivalent is often the sanctuary and just harm reduction education and harm reduction cosmic, cosmic care at boom what what is that uh, it's the cosmic care at the boom is that the euros call it um yeah you know unfortunately i think the harm reduction is somewhat a result of the increase in popularity i think the original smaller festivals didn't need that because they were tight enough of a family that everybody really knew everybody mm -hmm. and you were safe within that container of merely being there. Um, my favorite festival of all time was uh, 2009, uh, just outside of Yosemite. This one of the early symbiosis, which was probably about 6,000 people, and it was just the most spectacular feeling that you were with the right people at the right time and the right place in the planet. And it was just a privilege to be there, mm. you know? And 
I think lots of kids are still getting that experience. Just everything gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So it gets a little bit easier for cracks to develop, predators to appear, the dark side, you know. But yeah, I mean, what the, the, you have by recognizing the fact that people are using psychedelics, by offering harm reduction, drug testing at the European festivals. So that there's no issues with purity because people can't sell crap drugs because you mm -hmm. just go over the caravan and find out what you bought. Mm -hmm. um, these are all important steps to creating a larger psychedelic culture. Um, you know, this, this this is probably part of the problem is that things are growing quite rapidly, the same way Burning Man's grown rapidly, and um, you can only educate so many people along the way under the current system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm but just going to... The they're modern mystery schools. You know, we're, that's, we're trying to offer... We're trying to create an environment where you can induce a mystical experience through your joy. Yeah, yeah. And also, it, you having said modern mystery schools really ties into the growing uh, popularity of incorporating workshops and lectures and a whole educational side of things. I know for myself, as somebody who teaches lectures at festivals, that's part of why I'm there is to sort of plant um, seeds of knowledge that blossom in the midst of the festival, things that influence or contribute to the means by which the participants who, you know, witness uh, my lectures can be... Um, how it, how it influences the way that they engage their own experience with others, with themselves, and what might emerge in, in their psychedelic encounters, because I often talk about psychedelics. Um, how do you feel about this, um, the, the evolution of festivals pushing more so and more so to have conferences, not just the music and the DJs, but to feature teachers and um, speakers and symposiums? I think it's always been a big part of the transformational festival model. There's always been great speaker series since the start. Mm. I actually find these days festivals are more worried about having you speak about psychedelics as they become larger and more successful uh, because of the crack house laws, and uh, certainly in the USA, where they're worried they can actually be prosecuted um, by having, you know, harm reduction and, and anything that the crack house laws state that if you create an environment for the sale of drugs, you can be prosecuted as the person who sold the drugs. Mm. So some of these festivals are concerned that they will be targeted and don't really want pro psychedelic speakers. It's definitely been a push in the earlier days. I found it much easier to talk in the United States. I barely, I hardly do any talks in the States anymore. Uh, Europe, they're flying me to, in Australia, I get invited to all the time because they don't have those issues. Mm -hmm. um, I think the education side of it's great. I'm always impressed by how many people turn up. Uh, Burning Man always amazes me the size of the audiences we get. Um, the 2009 Symbiosis, which was my first speaking gig, we had a remarkable panel with myself, Alex and Alison Gray, Daniel Pinchbeck, and Nassim Harriman. Wow. And yeah. pretty much the entire, almost the entire festival turned up. I mean, there was seriously like 4,000 plus people crammed around trying to hear the five of us talk. And they wouldn't let us leave. I mean, it went on for like three or four hours. And finally, we were just like, we, we, we can't, we, we got to go, we got to go. And <laughs> it's that, like that a was one of the most amazing. Yeah, that was one of the most amazing experiences as a speaker I've ever had. And I was like, wow, this is great. This is what it's going to be like. And we've never had anything like that since. <laughs> <laughs> Which I always find uh, amusing. Um, Boom has an amazing speaker series. Zora has an amazing, amazing speaker series. There was... Um, yeah, I mean, there's a tendency in the States to get a little bit diverted, I think, mm -hmm. into some kind of more obscure topics. Sometimes I wish they were a little more care care carefully curated. 
but yeah, the intention's there. I personally am moving more towards doing more conferences and less festivals. Mm -hmm. But that's more of a personal thing due to the ease of getting in and out. And I enjoy the stimulation I get from conferences from being around large collections of light minds and super brains. Mm -hmm. The more super brains I can be around, the better. So, yeah, I really enjoy conferences. But both both have their place. I don't think we've found quite the middle ground, maybe, the correct. They're either a little too conferency or a little too festively. So maybe there is a middle ground there somewhere. Um, it's all good. You know, it, the big difference is there is talk, there is conferences, there is speaker series, there is conversation going on. So that's the really encouraging thing. And, of course, the internet has been the biggest thing that's, really evolved contemporary psychedelic culture, in my opinion, because here's this first time we've got this global, virtually uncensorable medium that kids all around the world can Google DMT or 5-MeO-DMT or entheogens or whatever, and then, you know, my book's going to pop up and your podcast's going to pop up, and mm -hmm. that is the most obvious representation of the interconnectivity of psych global psychedelic culture in this day and age. Like, I really want to go to China or somewhere and see what's going on there. Like, what are the raves like in China? It's going to be crazy. Yeah, I'm curious about that. I, I met some uh, Japanese Psytrance producers while I was um, traveling in Europe last year and or in 2016. And uh, I got really interested. Like, what is the underground Psytrance, like, psychedelic scene like in Japan? Because it's such an yeah. interesting, highly technical, neon environment, right? So, mm-hmm. Well, the Jap I mean, when you, my understanding is when you step away from contemporary Japanese culture, there's no real coming back. You can't just, you know, change your clothes and reappear. It's kind of a pretty permanent thing. Hmm. So, yeah, when I see the, age of the Japanese kids at the Site Trust events, festivals in Europe, because Europe's super multicultural, you know, you go to a European Site Trans festival, there's like 30 languages and every shade and color, and it's really cool. Mm -hmm. Um, but I always have particular respect for the Japanese ravers because, you know, they're probably a little further out there than most of us. So let's let's uh, let's let's tie into a close. Um, what's what's next for you, uh, Rock? Where, where where are you going from here? You've just finished. You've just finished this this excellent book. Um, you have, I'd say, you know, reinstated yourself or. Yeah, reinstated yourself as a as a as an important part pardon the word, but it works with the writing thing, but an important authority in psychedelic culture these days. Um, what what's next for you? Uh, you know, it's an interesting question. I'm I'm sort of been suffering the, the blues of the blues of finishing recently where I've had a, several big projects come to a fruition and I'm sort of wondering which direction I am gonna go. Um, I compete in paragliding. And um, I am on the New Zealand team. I've made the world championships in 2019. So I'm doing quite a lot of traveling flying, which is like a 3D yacht race, for those of you who don't know what that is. Uh, I finished a book of short stories recently, um, which is kind of the more dark side of psychedelic culture. It's called Who's Got the Bomb? I call the genre of psychedelic noir. Mm -hmm. So that's looking for a home. And I think I'm really going to go back to uh, a couple of novels that I've had sloshing around in my head for years, that Tryptamine Palace and this last book really pushed aside. And I think I'm kind of excited to get back into fiction writing um, and hopefully I can crack that egg. But, uh, yeah, I'm, uh, I just sort of let it come to me these days in some ways. I think I'm much better at that. And... Um, you know, I get sufficient invitations from psychedelic culture to be able to re-enter it a few times a year and really experience it. Um, I, I live outside quite a way, and living in New Orleans, I'm not part of the real West Coast scene. So, um, it, it, like most people in New Orleans, don't really get my, what I do. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I think I'm, I, you know, I'm an interesting sort of global representative that 
that can that can go in and out of different parts of the world and just maintain my own view. I don't, I don't really know the answer to that one. <laughs> All right, no, that's good. I'm, I'm happy. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I'm, ha- I'm happy to a- ask questions that that leave uh, leave you slightly confounded. Um, with, you know, like approaching something and being like, "Oh my god, it's so big! I don't know." Um, maybe just to wrap up, where can people find out more about James Orock? Where can they get your books, read your articles, etc.? Uh, the books are easy to find. Of course, they're on Amazon, but uh, numerous bookstores are actually carrying them because since they're covered by uh, carried by inner traditions. Um, I have a DMT information site called DMT site, S I T E.com, um, which is kind of an era word of just tryptamines, which not a lot of people don't think actually know much about. And I'm this year, my, one of my big things I do want to achieve this year is actually create my own social media platform and break away from the Facebook model and and have a blog and maybe some podcasts and some videos and access to all my stuff in one spot, including my photography. I'm a photographer. You're an excellent so photographer. So at some point, I James, your Instagram. At some point jamesorock.com will appear. Uh, and until that time, you can find me on the Insidious Facebook or Instagram uh, as James O'Rock or Tryptamine Palace. Great. Well, uh, the listeners who have been tuning in for a while will know what's coming, which is all of those links and references will be available at jameswjesso.com in the show notes to this episode. Um, Rock, thank you for being on the show today. Hey, my pleasure. Nice seeing you. I hope you enjoyed that episode of Adventures Through the Mind. Thank you very much for tuning in all the way to the end. And thank you very much in advance for sharing this on social media. Maybe you'll do it right now. I mean, maybe you'll just hit the like, you just hit the auto share, and it's just like share with all your friends. That's really supportive and I appreciate it. You could also tell a friend. That's pretty cool too. You know what else is really cool? Financial contributions, such as donations on PayPal or cryptocurrency, uh, or by becoming my patron on Patreon. Patreon being the means by which I earn a sustainable income that I can, you know, I can basically bet on while I commit my time to producing content like this for you. Huge thanks to my established patrons and a huge thanks to you for becoming my patron. You can find links on how to do so listed in the description to this episode, be it Patreon or a one-time donation. Finally, if you'd like to learn and stay up to date with what I'm doing, there is two primary ways you can do that. The first is by signing up for my newsletter. When you sign up for my newsletter, you actually get a free audiobook, which is my thoughts on how to work with psilocybin mushrooms as a spiritual ally in our, what I call the unfolding process of psycho-spiritual maturation. You head to bit.ly slash gesso newsletter to sign up or you could just follow the link that's contained in the description to this episode. The second way is simply to follow me on social media. I'm at James W. Gesso for Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And Instagram is definitely the best way to keep up to date with uh, my travel adventures, which I am currently on. Um, Well, I'm not currently on because currently I'm at home preparing in advance as you probably heard in the last episode. But anyways, I am currently on in the time travel sense of when you're listening to this will be the future from where I am now, where I'll be doing a thing in the time in which you're hearing it, it would be accurate to say so in the present tense. Either way, follow me on Instagram, Facebook, or on Twitter. Thanks for tuning in, and I will see you on the next episode of Adventures Through the Mind. Take care.